Another week, another episode of Shogun. This episode starts off dealing with the aftermath since last week's insane ending. We begin with Uejiro, Blackbone's gardener, complaining about the current situation in the village. As he does that, Toronaga arrives with his army from Edo, accompanied by none other than Buntaro, donning some cool scars on his face. He is in fact alive and well, and Mariko has a reaction of both shock and fear since her husband, who she just cheated on, had just come back from the dead. While Mariko's relationship with Buntaro was very similar in the book, the way she speaks about him is very different. In the book, she had a very abrasive loyalty to him, even in the private conversations with Blackthorn. At one point in the book, before Buntaro's return, she has a conversation with Blackthorn. I wish you were to be consul, he said. I belong to Lord Buntaro, and until he is dead, I cannot think or say what might be thought or said. Page 499. In contrast, her dislike of Buntaro is very clear from the beginning of the show. I personally don't mind this change since most of Mariko's dislike of Buntaro is shown via her facial expression, something that the book couldn't do. And unlike the book, the show can't show her inner monologues of how she really feels, so I think this is a good alternative. We move on to the Council of Regents having yet another meeting and finally agreeing to impeach Toronaga. Unfortunately for them, Toronaga's deft understanding of the rules means that they can't impeach him and subsequently execute him since the council requires five members to do so, essentially buying Toronaga some much needed time. Next we have a major scene with Toronaga. Toronaga speaks to Mariko about Buntaro's return and gives her a pheasant to give to Blackthorn. She leaves and then Toronaga speaks with the star of last episode, Naga. Naga is somewhat apologetic to him for his actions and Toronaga just looks at him silently. He then proceeds to educate his son on the tactics of manipulation and planning, letting him know that Yabu and Omi had most likely manipulated him into killing Josen and furthering their goal. This scene is a huge insight into how Toronaga was able to rise to power and become the capable man he is today. He explains the art of controlling men, comparing them to falcons, stating that some can be flown straight from the fist, killing anything that moves, while others are lazy and tempted by the law, but all men can be broken. For TV viewers, this analogy may have come off as a little random, but in the book, Toronaga is shown as an avid falconer. He often used these hunts as a way to be alone and think, having inner monologues comparing people to the birds that he had mastered. Toronaga turned over to get more comfortable and smiled to himself. But the Anjin sends not a long-winged falcon, a hawk of the law, that you fly free above you to stoop at a particular quarry. Page 618. If you're enjoying this video, like and subscribe for more. I post a video a week and will be doing these Shogun videos every week as well. The conversation with Naga was actually quite different in the book. While the show's version of Naga doesn't question his father much and wants his approval and respect, his book counterpart constantly questions his dad's actions, often not understanding why he did what he did for much of the story. I invited you to hunt Naga-san, not to repeat views that I've already heard, Toronaga said. I beg you father, for the last time, stop the training, outlaw guns, destroy the barbarian, declare the experiment a failure and then have done with this obscenity. No, for the last time. Page 612. Naga then continues to pester Toronaga, pleading with him to leave Anjiro and end the regiment's training. Naga also kept warning Toronaga of the risk that Yabu presented, which caused Toronaga for the first time in the book to lose his temper. One carrier pigeon from Ishido and Yabu can destroy you whenever he wants. How do you know he isn't planning treachery with Ishido? I'm sure he's considering it. I would if I were he. Wouldn't you? No, I wouldn't. Then you'd soon be dead, which would be absolutely merited. But so would all your family, all your clan and all your vassals, which would be absolutely unforgivable. You're a stupid, truculent fool. You won't use your mind, you won't listen, you won't learn, you won't curb your tongue or your temper. You let yourself be manipulated in the most childish way and believe that everything can be solved with the edge of a sword. The only reason I don't take your stupid head or let you end your present worthless life is because you're young. Because I used to think you had some possibility. Your mistakes are not malicious. There's no gal in you and your loyalty is unquestioned. But if you don't quickly learn patience and self-discipline, I'll take away your samurai status and order you and all your generations into the peasant class. Toronaga's right fist slammed his saddle and the falcon let out a piercing, nervous scream. Do you understand? Page 613. In the book, this was an eye-opening conversation for Naga. He had previously never really understood the ramifications of his stupid actions. His incessant questioning of his father's action was always seen as young naivety by Toronaga and was always treated as such. This time it was different and he felt now more than ever that he had made a grave mistake. 
Naga was in shock. In his whole life, Naga had never seen his father shout with rage or lose his temper, or even heard of him doing so. Many times he had felt the bite of his tongue, but with justification. Naga knew he made many mistakes, but always his father had turned it so that what he'd done no longer seemed as stupid as it had at first. For instance, when Toronaga had shown him how he had fallen into Omi's or Yabu's trap about Josen, he had to be physically stopped from charging off at once to murder them both. But Toronaga had ordered his private guard to pour cold war over Naga until he was rational and had calmly explained that he, Naga, had helped his father immeasurably by eliminating Josen's menace. Page 613. While there were many moments depicting Toronaga's genius as a strategist as well as a manipulator and controller of men, this was one of the first times we got insight into his worldview, rather than just seeing the results of his tactics. This scene showed just how smart he was and how disappointed he was to see his son being manipulated by the very men he looked down upon intellectually and referred to as Falcons. The scene then ends with Naga reminiscing about what his father had told them after revealing that he had been manipulated by Omi and Yabu. Soon you'll be able to manipulate them. What you did was very good, but you must learn to reason what's in a man's mind if you're to be of any use to yourself or to your lord. I need leaders, I have fanatics enough. Always his father had been reasonable and forgiving but today Naga leapt off his horse and knelt objectively. Please forgive me father. I love this scene because we learned so much about Toronaga by the way he dealt with his son. It was important since Toronaga kept his cards close to his chest so we never really know what he's thinking. I understand the time constraints that shows having the unfortunate need to cut things out. This is why I always recommend you guys read the book. Even though some of the main story beats are the same, I think there are a lot of stuff missing and many cut scenes that make the book worth reading. Moving on to another significant scene. We see Blackthorn excitedly explaining the significance of the pheasant to his house star, talking about how one of the first chores he did was clean and game. He then hangs up the bird to mature and half-heartedly tells his staff that it's forbidden and anyone who touches it will be punished by death in broken Japanese. Respect to the show because this was pretty much directly adapted from the book. I was worried about this scene and the subsequent scenes that followed might be rushed or skipped but they kept it and I'm glad they did since it's a pivotal scene for Blackthorn's development. We then move on to a few scenes. Bunturo's arrival at Blackthorn's house and conversation with Fuji, his niece, and then a conversation between Yabu and Toronaga. One thing I love about Toronaga and Yabu's interaction is the way Toronaga plays Yabu like a fiddle. Yabu throws Omi under the bus for manipulating Naga, expecting Toronaga to punish him, only for him to be praised. Toronaga is an intelligent warrior and plays the political game better than anyone, so I'm glad they are showing that more and more, especially in this episode. We then get a nice wholesome scene with Blackthorn and the gardener, Oejiro, explaining that without a good rock, a garden is just a place for growing and Blackthorn smiles to himself and agrees. Let me know in the comments if you are wondering why we got this scene in the first place. I assume from a non-book reader's perspective it was somewhat random and maybe pointless. As soon as I saw this I knew they were going to go through with his eventual death and man, it is a pretty sad scene. The scene is very significant though because that very rock is the centre of quite a heartwarming moment later on. We move on to the dinner scene with Buntaro, one of the most iconic scenes in the book. Buntaro and Blackthorn have a conversation about their lives and it quickly turns into a drinking contest. While some things are different in the book like how Buntaro is actually the one to say that the cups are too small. Most of the scene went very similar to the book. One thing I'm glad they're showing is Blackthorn's boldness. The show's version of the character has been a bit more passive than his book counterpart so I'm glad that they made sure he didn't fall to Buntaro in the conversation. He refuses and then tells Buntaro in basic Japanese to tell him about his experience in the war and gestures arrows being shot. Buntaro of course takes this as a challenge and decides he'd rather show than tell. Buntaro asks Blackthorn to choose a post and through the shoji doors he shoots two arrows perfectly into the post. This scene again was pretty much adapted perfectly, down to the fact that he shot it directly past Mariko's face. I'm glad they kept the scene in because it was a cool way to accentuate Buntaro's ability. In a lot of entertainment, characters deem as bad people are generally shown as inept a lot of the time, which it simply isn't true. There are plenty of bad people out there who are immensely skilled, as well as good people out there who are inept. Morality and skill don't always coincide and this was a good depiction of that. The only difference in the arrow scene was that in the book he shot 5 arrows not 2 but I don't think that makes much difference. Honestly just great stuff from the show. Let me know what you thought about the scene and to the TV only viewers let me know if you think that it lived up to the hype that many of the book readers put on it. Me included. I, th I think it did personally. We then finally get the reveal of Mariko's backstory. Quite a sad scene but even sadder in the book's version in my opinion. In the original Mariko doesn't justify her father's actions and calls him an assassin. She states that her bloodline is tainted and actually thanks her husband for not disowning her. She originally says that her father and her family died honourably, the family humbly lying down to be beheaded by the father before he committed seppuku himself. However then she corrects herself and brands them as enemies and while we know that's not what she actually feels, it's still sad that she's indoctrinated into believing that
knowing that this is the truth. Moving on, next we see Blackthorn woken up in the middle of the night by some screams and loud thudding noises. He runs to inspect and is stopped by Fuji but barges through and finds that Mariko was just beaten by Buntaro. Filled with rage he grabs his pistols and runs off after him. We get this cool framing of the scene looking reminiscent of a duel from Ghost of Tsushima. Surprisingly Blackthorn doesn't get the fight he was expecting, instead Buntaro bows to him and blames the sake. This was an excellent scene but it went quite differently in the book. The setup was the same, Blackthorn chasing after Buntaro, finding him and Buntaro bowing but then things start to differ. Then conscious that it was rude to stand while they were kneeling and that the Nanja was an almost intolerable and certainly unnecessary insult, Blackthorn knelt and holding on to the pistols, put both hands on the ground and bowed in return. He sat back on his heels, height he had asked, with forced polite. Buntaro went on to apologise for what he had done and while Blackthorn didn't understand why he did what he did, Buntaro humbly asked for forgiveness and went on and on and then ceased and bowed his head into the floor. Blackthorn's blinding rage had vanished by now. Shigata Ganai, he said huskily, which meant it can't be helped or there's nothing to be done. Shigata Ganai, Blackthorn repeated. And now that it was clear the apology was genuine, he thanked God for giving him the miraculous opportunity to call off the duel. He knew that he had no rights, he had acted like a madman and the only way to resolve this crisis with Buntaro was according to the rules and that meant Toronaga, page 609. This scene was quite a big one to cut or change. I personally believe that it was key to showing how Blackthorn had begun to change and understand how to function in Japanese society. The scene ends with Blackthorn thinking, but why the apology he was asking himself frantically. Think, you've got to learn to think like them. Then the solution rushed into his brain. It must be because I'm Hatamoto and Buntaro, the guest, deserved the wa, the harmony of my house. At this point in the original book, Blackthorn starts to change and learn to adapt and become an actual samurai in the way that he thinks and acts. Skipping scenes like this is kind of skipping that development so I hope they don't skip future scenes that show his mindset shifted. Moving on to a scene with Toronaga and Muraji or just Mura as he's called in the book. It's revealed that he is in fact the spy. This is the, also the same in the book although this was revealed way sooner. We find this out in the original in the final pages and it's quite a significant scene. I'm not sure why they did it so early since it doesn't really change the grand scheme of the plot. This was kind of like an extra tidbit at the end of the book and because of that the reveal was much more impactful at the end. Kind of seems like an unnecessary change in my opinion. Next we have quite a sad scene with Mariko and Blackthorn and Mariko essentially ends their friendship slash pseudo relationship and says they will no longer speak or see each other. After the beating in the book Blackthorn doesn't actually see Mariko for quite a while because she's ordered to stay at Omi's house. Toronaga had let Buntura rant on until he was spent, then dismissed him, ordering him to stay away from Mariko until he considered what was to be done. He dispatched his own doctor to examine her. The report was favourable, bruises but no internal damage. For his own safety because he expected treachery and the sand of time was running out, Toronaga decided to increase the pressure on all of them. He ordered Mariko into Omi's house with the instructions to rest, to stay within the confines of the house and completely out of the Anjin San's way. Page 621. Next we move on to the saddest scene in the episode, the death of Uejiro. Since so much was going on, Blackthorn pretty much forgot about the bird that he left to mature and this was quite a big issue for the village. Since they were all vegetarian due to their Buddhist beliefs, the smell of rotting meat was even more appalling. But since the lord of the house forbade its removal they couldn't do anything. Eventually Uejiro volunteered to remove it and be killed since he was already having health issues, a seemingly sound resolution. This shook Blackthorn to the core since he offhandedly said that anyone who touched it would die not realising the severity of his work. Originally he blames Fujiko but then realises he himself is to blame and is thrown into a depression because of the guilt. This scene like many others in the episode was ripped straight out of the book, damn near the exact same. Oh that old bugger, Uekia, the gardener, the kind toothless old man who tended the plants with loving hands and made his garden beautiful. Yui, Motekuru Uekia, good. Fetch him. Fujiko shook her head. Her face had become chalky white. Uekiya shinda desu. Shinda desu, she whispered. Jesus Christ, God. You put that old man to death over a stinking God-cursed pheasant? At once all the servants rushed to the garden and fell on their knees. They put their heads into the dirt and froze. Even children of the cook. What the piss hell's going on? Blackthorn was almost berserk. Page 641. In the book, this part ended with a touching scene of Blackthorn naming the rock that Uejiro cared about so much after him. Hopefully we get that in the show. Blackthorn touched the rock. I name you Uekia Sama, he said. This pleased him and he knew that if Uekia were alive, the old man would have been very pleased also. Even though he's dead, perhaps he'll know, Blackthorn told himself. Perhaps his kami is here now. Shinto was believed that when they died, they became a kami. 
Finally, we have the earthquake scene. This was pretty different from the book, but the changes made sense. In the book, the earth literally opens up and kind of eats Toronaga and Mariko. Blackthorn saves them both before the earth closes up again. This is somewhat unrealistic. From what I know, apparently earthquakes don't actually work that way, or perhaps it was too CGI heavy to show the earth literally splitting apart and then rejoining. Either way, the show's version was fine. After Blackthorn saves Toronaga, we see him offer to replace Toronaga's lost swords with his own, which is directly ripped from the book. Lastly, we have Blackthorn going back and seeing the destruction of the village. He has a tender moment with Fujiko and she's hurt, which is also the same in the book. And he walks over to the rock that Weijiro cared so much about and repositions it. And that closes the curtain on another excellent episode of Shogun. I'm truly loving this show and I hope that it can keep going strong. As always, let me know what you thought about the episode and my breakdown. I apologize for releasing the video a little late, by the way. I had some long shifts over the last couple days, so I had to delay the recording until today. Like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. I post Shogun breakdowns every week and yeah, till next time.